Hello everyone, um, and this is my thesis defense presentation. I, this presentation is going to be the second time now that I share information about uh, results of my thesis research. Some of you may have seen presentations from me um, focusing on mushroom development and uh, the methods that I was using to do this experiment. So now you'll get a chance to see uh, what we actually got out of the research. So my presentation is going to start off with a little bit of, of background into mushroom development, and I'll also have to tell you about my study organism Flamulina volutopes, and then I'll get to the exciting part, how I researched uh, mushroom development in Flamulina volutopes. I'll go over my methods, and then the really interesting part is the results section, and that's the part I'm most excited to share with you today. And finally, I'll wrap up with a bit of a conclusion on what I would like you to remember from this presentation. Okay, so before we begin, I have to tell you a little, about, little bit about fungal cells because they are rather strange. And I'm going to be using these words throughout the presentation, so um, I have to make sure you're familiar with them. So fungal cells are usually arranged into these cylindrical chains of cells called hyphae. And these hyphae can branch and fuse with one another to make a mycelium. So that is the main body of the fungus. It's what carries out the day-to-day -day functions and operations and keeps the whole organism alive, this network of interconnected hyphae. So remember those two words, hypha or hyphae and mycelium. Uh, they're going to be popping up time and again throughout my presentation. Okay, now let's get started with some brief background on mushroom development. So before mushroom development begins, we already have to have a mycelium in place that is growing and feeding on its substrate. And once it gets big enough to support reproduction, and then it senses conditions are right for um, actually making mushrooms, it'll go about starting the process of mushroom development. And the first thing that happens is that a small ball of cells clumps together to form a structure called a fruit body initial. Uh, this is really just a loose ball of cells, and there's not much going on structurally at this point, uh, but this is the structure upon which the rest of the mushroom is going to be built. So next, uh, more and more hyphae start growing into the fruit body initial, and it gets denser and denser, and eventually tissues start to appear. And at this point, we call it a primordium. Now, by the end of the primordium stage, the... Um, all major tissues of the mushroom are already established. So if you cut one in half, you'll be able to see where the cap is, where the stipe is, and where the gills are. So that means all that's left to do for the mushroom is to expand all of these structures. And basically, the whole mushroom just inflates like a balloon. So this explains why it's um, why mushrooms can appear so quickly. So if you go out one day, and there's no mushrooms in your yard, and the next day they're all over the place, it's because the primordia are already there, set up, and ready to go, and the whole structure just has to inflate to get to its final shape. So, how does that happen? Well, typically the stipe elongates first, followed by the pileus expanding, and lastly, the gills expand. So, there is one major limitation to this model, however, and that is that the model was created using research into gilled mushrooms, and that's it. So let me get out my um, laser pointer thingy. Here we are. So this one grid in my picture right here, um, this is a, of a gilled mushroom, and all of the others, all of the other pictures on this slide have not been studied from a developmental perspective. So we don't really know what's happening in morels or jelly fungi or polypores or these little things that grow on uh, beetles. We don't know the principles of development for those things. And there's good reason to suspect that they use different developmental um, strategies than gilled mushrooms because mycologists actually recognize two different types of development, determinate growth and indeterminate growth. So these two processes, um, when you look at determinate growth mushrooms, you can recognize they're using that process because they will push aside nearby mushrooms and they'll also push aside any debris that's around the mushroom. 
Uh, this is a typical process that you see in guild mushrooms, so this is the one that fits our model of development. Indeterminate growth mushrooms, however, will fuse with nearby mushrooms and they'll engulf debris into their fruiting bodies. So this is often seen in polypores, which have not been studied in terms of mushroom development. So two different versions of growth, they seem to have two different strategies at a cellular level um, to make their um, fruiting bodies. So we're not quite sure what's going on and why these two are different, uh, but that difference exists. Fortunately, for the rest of my presentation, I can assume that our model of mushroom development is correct because my study organism is in fact a gilled mushroom. So this model does apply. And speaking of my model organism, it is Flamuline of Volutipes. In case you're not familiar with this species, you can recognize it in the field by its slimy orange pileus, the attached pale yellow gills that leave a white spore print, the velvety black stipe, the clustered growth, and the fact that it grows on hardwoods. So this is the form you find in the wild, but you can also get this, form, uh, this species in the grocery store. But when you find it in the grocery stores, it looks completely different. Instead of this nice mushroom shape with bright colors, it grows as this pale, long, spaghetti-like form with pale colors, a tiny pileus, and underdeveloped gills. In grocery stores, this is usually sold as an enoki or enokitaki, which are the Japanese names for the mushroom. Um, in order to specifically grow the mushroom in this spaghetti-like form, um, normally the mushrooms are grown on a in a bottle of a bottle containing sawdust and some grain, and that's what the mushroom normally eats as food. To make this spaghetti-like form, you actually have to add a collar on top of that bottle, and that collar serves two purposes. First of all, it raises the concentration of carbon dioxide around the mushrooms. Mushrooms, um, like us, breathe out carbon dioxide, so as they grow, they're going to be producing carbon dioxide, and adding that collar kind of keeps that carbon dioxide trapped right next to the mushrooms. So first, the collar raises carbon dioxide levels. Secondly, the collar also blocks any incoming light. So that creates a dark environment. And those two things, high carbon dioxide concentration and low light, trigger growth in this spaghetti-like enoki form. So um, I have a picture on the screen here in the middle that shows how I achieved this form in my research. Um, I found that a tin can fit exactly on top of the bottles I was using, so I just got a tin can, put it on top, and I actually had to add a second can to the top of that in order to block light because my light source was coming in from above. All right. Um, this form is also found in the wild on occasion, and I haven't been lucky enough to find this, but I got a beautiful picture of it from somebody in the Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club. The, these mushrooms were growing on their property, and um, you can see the normal form growing on the left side of this picture. And the rest of it was actually underneath the bark. So when she found those uh, first ones, she peeled off the bark next to them, and lo and behold, at the bottom we see these long, pale, skinny mushrooms. So this is actually that spaghetti-like enoki form growing underneath the bark, which um, underneath bark, you have those same two conditions, low light and high carbon dioxide. And the bark kind of ended about where the top of the picture is. So these mushrooms that were closer to the surface of the bark um, had started to transition from the spaghetti-like form to the normal form because they were able to sense some light coming in from above and some fresh air. So this spaghetti-like form is actually useful to the fungus because um, it allows the mushroom to devote all of its resources into growing, growing up. And the more it grows up, the more likely it is to be able to find a crack in the bark that it can squeeze through and then fruit. Um, and the whole point of producing a mushroom is to release your spores into the air currents. You can't do that under bark, so by escaping the bark using this enoki form, the mushroom is actually increasing its chances of successful reproduction. 
So this form is uh, very helpful to the fungus. Okay, um, that's all I have about the Flamulina morphology. And before we get on to what I'm looking at, I do have to go over some background on some basic biology. So hopefully you remember from high school biology classes that all of the information that your cells need in order to create um, your all the various structures in your body is contained on genes in DNA. And the DNA has a problem. It is trapped inside the nucleus, but all the activity that happens in the cell, uh, the vast majority of that happens outside the nucleus in the cytoplasm. So the DNA has to get messages from the nucleus out into the rest of the cell. And in order to do that, it uses a molecule called mRNA. So mRNA, the M stands for messenger. You can guess then what its role is. It copies down a message from DNA, and then it carries those instructions out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm. Once in the cytoplasm, a structure called a ribosome attaches to it, reads those instructions, produces an amino acid chain, which is then folded and becomes a protein. So in order for your cells to function properly, all of these three steps have to be working. You have to have information stored on DNA. That information is read by mRNA and carried into the cytoplasm. Those instructions are then converted into proteins. So if you want to know what a cell is doing, you can study all three of these components. Um, studying DNA will tell you everything an organism can do. If you study mRNA you'll, or proteins, you'll figure out what an organism is doing at any point in time. So obviously the cells in your body don't need to make all of their genes all the time. Like your brain cells don't need to be making liver proteins. They just need to make brain proteins. So they have the genes for brain and liver proteins, but they're only going to be copying down the messages to make proteins for um, brain-related proteins. So by changing the genes that are active or the genes that are expressed, cells can change their behavior, shape, and um, anything else they want to do. So my research is going to be looking at these messages that are sent out of the nucleus, uh, in, in other words, the mRNA molecules, um, to figure out what the cells are doing in different parts of mushrooms and to try and figure out why that's making them look different. So there has been a significant amount of previous research in this topic, specifically in flamulina volutipes, and I just have an abbreviated version of the, the list here, but it is representative of the major studies in the field. So one of the things I want you to notice from this list is that basically everybody has studied the early stages of mushroom growth. So the mycelium has been studied by most researchers. It's a useful baseline because it's not the mushroom, so that's something you can compare mushroom tissues to. And the first stage in uh, mushroom development, the primordium, has also been heavily studied. The, er the later stages are kind of hit and miss. Um, specifically, the mature normal form has been studied in only three studies and that has been covered a total of 24 genes. Uh, compare that number, 24, to the 11,188 genes that were studied by Park et al. in the stipe and pileus of the mature cultivated form. 24 is hardly anything, so we really don't know what's going on in the mature normal form of the mushroom. Um, even though the mature cultivated form has been studied um, quite a bit, the specific tissues in the mature cultivated form have only been looked at in two different studies. And in fact, this is the only time tissues have been looked at in any of our Flamulina volutipes studies. So tissues, of course, are present in the primordium and Therefore, um, tissue level gene expression differences should be present from the primordium all throughout uh, mushroom maturity. So it's surprising to me that uh, so few researchers have studied the phenomenon of um, gene expression in the specific tissues. So these are some significant gaps in our knowledge of mushroom development. 
And in my research, I tried to close all of those gaps. Okay, um, so what were my objectives for my research? First of all, I wanted to identify tissue level gene expression differences. Um, I wanted to do that as development progresses and also specifically look at the normal differences between the normal and cultivated forms. So how did I do this? Well, first of all, I had to collect a sample from the wild, which I could then grow on a petri dish and transfer to a spawn jar. Uh, this is basically just filled with sterilized rye grain, and then you add in the fungus, let it colonize the entire jar, and then you can move it um, from the grains to the fruiting mixture, which is a mixture of sawdust with some extra rye grain. Uh, remember that Flamuline of Lutipes is a hardwood decomposer, so this sawdust is providing most of the nutrition for the fungus. The rye just provides a little bit of extra nitrogen to encourage mushroom formation. Once that jar is fully colonized, it can be transferred to the fruiting chamber. And this is the one that I built for my um, research in my apartment. It has two major features. There is a white light um, above here, and um, that ensures that I can grow the normal form of the fungus. And it also encourages primordium formation. Second major feature, which you can't see because it's hidden underneath these boxes, is that the jars of mushrooms are actually floating in a, an ice water bath. And that's important because Flamulina won't make mushrooms above 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So every time um, the temperature got above 60 degrees, I could just add some ice cubes to the water bath and lower the temperature in the fruiting chamber. Also for the cultivated form, once the primordia developed in the jar assigned Sorry, uh, the jar assigned to that form. I could add the um, collar to the jar and trigger um, the cultivated morphology. Okay, um, I do have to mention a little bit about my setup inside the fruiting chamber. And I could only fit four jars at any one time. So I did a total of three replicates of all my samples. So I carried out this whole process three times and the jars were assigned to um, one of the four stages that I selected for my experiment. And each of those four stages was represented in all three of those runs. However, I randomly decided where that jar assigned to that stage was going to go in the fruiting chamber. So I used a random number generator to assign positions. Um, that's going to be important a bit later on. So remember that idea that the positions of the jars were randomized inside the fruiting chamber. Okay, uh, once each jar had reached its assigned stage, I could begin sampling. And I sampled four different stages at, or sorry, four different tissues from four different stages of development. The developmental stages I sampled were the primordium, young normal mushrooms, mature cultivated mushrooms, and mature normal mushrooms. From each of those, I took samples of the mycelium below the fungus, sorry, my, the mycelium below the mushroom, the stipe, gills, and pileus. So four stages, four tissues, and three replicates means that I had a total of 48 samples. Uh, this is what it looked like in real life. Um, these are the fruit body initials. I did not sample them, but they are, you can see they're loose balls of hyphae. And in Flamulina, they form around these amber-colored droplets of liquid, which is actually pretty useful if you want to study these early stages because they are really easy to see growing on a petri dish. Um, after that stage comes the primordium. This is the first stage that I actually sampled, and you can see they're triangular in Flamulina, and at the tip of the triangle, there's actually a tiny little pileus and gills. After the primordium had formed, the young mushrooms looked basically the same, except that the stipe has begun elongating. And the cultivated form, of course, has a very long stipe, but the pileus is still really small and the gills are underdeveloped. And the last stage that I sampled was the mature normal form of the mushrooms, which these got a little bit longer than I uh, had intended because of challenges with um, getting fresh air into the fruiting chamber. But you can see they still managed to develop that black fuzzy stipe and those ones on the side are the ones I actually selected for my um, sampling. Okay, uh, once each sample was collected, I had to immediately freeze it in liquid nitrogen 
And then I could um, collect all the samples and later do a process called RNA-seq. And this is just a method of extracting and sequencing all of the mRNA in a sample. So the first step in this process is to crush your sample. And then uh, you can use several kits to extract the RNA in each sample. And there's several types of RNA mixed in there. Um, so we have to specifically take out the mRNA because that's what we want. Once we have our mRNA, we convert that into a copy of cDNA. Um, the C just stands for copy. It's a reminder that the DNA you're working with is not the original molecule that you started with. It's a copy of the original mRNA molecule. And we make this copy because DNA is easier to work with. Um, and it's the sequencing technology for DNA already exists. So it's a lot easier and cheaper to just convert your mRNA into uh, DNA. Uh, after you have your cDNA molecules, you can then um, add little bits of uh, DNA onto either end. And these are specific things called barcoded Illumina adapters. So the barcoded part means that um, there's a little short sequence in your DNA that tells you where each specific piece of cDNA came from. So what sample did this piece of DNA come from? Um, and the Illumina adapter part is necessary for interfacing with the sequencing machine itself. So once you've added the barcoded adapters, you can then copy your DNA a little bit, um, and that just ensures you have enough of it to submit for sequencing. Next, you submit it for sequencing, and I use the Illumina platform, which gives you a giant data set um, of A's, T's, G's, and C's. And these files are really big, and so it would be impossible for anybody to look at them and analyze them by hand. So the last step is that we have to analyze the data using computers. Although I've drawn these as squiggles, uh, this is what it looked like in real life. Um, it was mostly transferring liquids from one little tube to the next. Um, I wasn't working with squiggles, I was working with uh, liquids of various colors, mostly clear. All right, um, once I got my uh, sequences back, I could do some data analysis on them. This is the big overview of the entire pipeline that I used. And I'm gonna go through these various steps um, and explain what's happening in each of them. So first of all, we started off with sequence trimming. I had to use a couple different programs to get rid of sequences in the data set that were not particularly useful. So some of the sequences were low quality or short or um, turned out to be primers. And so those don't actually tell us anything about what Flamulin is doing. So we just had to get rid of those right off the bat. Um, after trimming, we ended up with 473.3 million trimmed sequences. So 473 million sequences, again, that is an enormous file. It's not something that is possible to work on by hand. So we have to go back to the computers to figure out what this all means. And the first step, the first program we used to um, do that was HiSat. And HiSat uh, is a program that matches up each sequence to the part of the genome um, in Flamulina that produced the sequence. So it matches up our pieces of cDNA with where the original mRNA molecule was copied down from in the genome. Um, after that finished, we used the program string tie to tie all those pieces together to make a file called a transcriptome. And then it also estimated the original amount of mRNA that was present in each sample. So after going, after running string tie, we ended up with our file of combined sequences, which we call a transcriptome, um, and it contained 20,909 different transcripts. So I've actually got a picture of this file. It's just a very small piece on the side of our screen here. And you can see that each M string number represents a different, um, what we call a transcript. And most of these end in 0.1 but some of them actually end in 0 0.2 or 0 0.3, 4, 5. And this means that um, that one gene can make a couple different versions of itself. In this case, with our top sequence, the gene made two different versions of itself. So um, above this one in the file, there is a n-string 4379.1. 
So um, each of these different versions we call a transcript. And our total transcriptome ended up containing 20,909 transcripts, which is roughly the same as uh, what previous studies have found. And if we just looked at those from the gene level, that equates to about 4,416 potential genes. The thalamulin of Ludipi's genome is estimated con to contain between 12 and 14,000 genes. So this number is a little bit high and we probably have some more transcripts uh, rather than genes hiding in this file. But it means that we um, sequenced the vast majority of the flamuline of Ludipi's genome, which is good, and that means we can move on to our next step in the process. Okay, um, at this point we had to remove all of the sequences that corresponded to our RNA. That is a type of RNA that doesn't give us any useful information, so we had to get them out of there. Uh, we also removed all the samples that had fewer than 300 distinct transcripts. So this just means um, 300 transcripts out of a total of 20,000 is a very small number. So they didn't really have enough data in them, so the sample didn't sequence very well, and these small samples were just not very um, usable for the next part of the analysis. So after getting rid of those samples, this is what our sample coverage looked like. Um, we started off with three replicates of every sample. So all of these numbers were originally three. After removing the small samples, most of them still have three samples included. Um, a, few, a few of them are down to two and only one of the samples um, contains only one replicate after removing the short ones. So we still have pretty good coverage and this is a good enough result to continue on with our analysis. Okay, and the next step is another quality control step, and this is a program called Busco. And Busco um, gives us results like this. Basically what it does is it compares the whole transcriptome to a set of known genes that are necessary for all the gilled mushrooms um, to live. So the important number here is this first one, 71.8%. That means that 71.8% of those core genes, the ones that are necessary for all gilled mushrooms to grow, um, were contained within our transcriptome. Now, if we were doing a genome assembly, um, we would want this number to be much higher. But because we're looking at the transcriptome and we don't expect every gene to be expressed all the time, 71.8% uh, is a good enough result to continue on because we got most of the genes and um, it means that we have uh, a good sampling out of the um, total possible genes that we got. All right, uh, next step is principal components analysis. And this is another quality control step. And this one is where we want to know if anything in the study design influenced the results. So here I have two, what we call PCA plots. And you'll notice um, basically what these plots are is that we took the entire transcriptome and gene expression data for every gene and every sample and plotted it in a two-dimensional space. Uh, so these axes, PC1 and PC2, don't actually mean anything. The important thing on these graphs is how close together two samples are. So the closer together two of the dots are, that means the more similar those two samples are. And here I have color coded and changed the shape of the dots based on the jar, batch, and position of each sample. So remember that I randomized um, every, the position of all the jars in my study, which means that we want this to look random because if it's not random, that means there's something specific about my study design that influenced um, expression in the mushrooms. And that is not something we wanted. We wanted um, the mushrooms themselves to be the major thing influencing expression. So if we look at these two graphs, um, the colors and shapes are all randomly distributed, which means that um, the study design worked. There are no major impacts from external sources on gene expression. So compare that to my next PCA plot, 
where I compared tissue and developmental stage um, for each sample. And here we actually do see some patterns emerge. For example, all the stipe tissue is contained mostly below the zero line on this graph. Whereas the gill and uh, pileus samples cluster up here on the top of the graph. And all the mycelium samples ended up at the origin of the graph over here. So tissue and um, to a lesser extent, developmental stage are influencing um, the, the gene activity levels in the samples, which is good because that's exactly what we wanted to find in this study. So my um, study worked so far, which means that we can go on to the next step of the process, which is a program called Ballgown. And what Ballgown does is it statistically analyzes the data to figure out if any genes are expressed at different levels at different tissues or stages of development. So after running ball gown, we got a big list of, of what we call differentially expressed genes. And lists aren't very useful, so we had to actually put names onto these M string numbers to figure out what those genes actually are. And after running ball gown and naming the things, we were able to find 2,183 genes that had different expression levels based on tissue or growth stage. And on top of that, we were able to name 1,456 of those. Okay, um, now we have some named lists, but of course that again is not very uh, helpful information from a um, understanding what the data means standpoint. So the last step in this process is to actually graph these things and change those lists into information that can be easily interpreted visually which is what I'm really excited to share with you today. So the first graph I have for you is this big plot called a heat map. And there's lots of things going on in this heat map. And the first, of, um, first thing you'll probably notice for this graph is that there's lots of different colors. Uh, so what do those colors mean? Well, there's this legend up at the top that shows us that the uh, light yellow color means that there is no gene expression for that gene whereas the dark red color means that gene expression is very high. So um, that explains most of the colors on our graph, but we have some other elements as well. The next thing you probably see is that there are these weird lines on the top and side of the graph. These are actually structures called dendrograms. And basically all of the, um, in this case, if we're looking at the dendrogram on the top, all of the columns are arranged based on how similar the gene expression of that column is to the other columns. And each column in this case represents a different sample, which are all listed down the bottom there. And so two samples that are closer together have more similar gene expression patterns than two samples that are further apart. And when I say closer together, what I actually mean is that they share these branches on the dendrogram. So these three samples on the side here, they're all sharing uh, this branch at the end. They're pretty close together, so they have pretty uh, similar gene expression patterns to each other. But they kind of connect um, to a lesser extent with this group in the middle here. Um, so you have to go back a few steps in order to find a point where it connects with these other branches. So the expression pattern of this branch in the middle is not quite as uh, similar to the expression pattern of the three samples on the side. Okay, uh, the heat map on the side basically shows you the same thing, uh, but it instead groups the rows together, and each row represents a different gene. I actually have all, twin, or sorry, all 2,000 genes listed on the side of this graph here, which of course is way too many to actually print their names on a PowerPoint slide, so you see them as a black line. So the uh, dendrogram at the top groups samples by gene expression, whereas the dendrogram on the side groups genes by their expression pattern across the various samples. Okay, uh, so what do we see when we look at this heat map? Well, um, I'm going to actually pause for a little bit and let you look at it for a bit and see if any patterns jump out at you 
So is there anything in particular that you see as you look at this heat map? Okay, if you need more time, of course, you can pause the video. Um, and I recommend you do that because it's always good to uh, think for yourself uh, when you're looking at scientific figures, because what jumps out at me might not jump out at you, and your interpretation is just as valid as mine is. So while I, the first thing that jumped out at me when I looked at this graph was this sample on the side, sample 46. Now this was a mycelium sample, and as you can see from its expression pattern, uh, let me take away this blue box for a bit so it's more obvious, but it is completely different than all of the other samples. And in fact, if you look at the dendrogram for sample 46, it has this big long line all the way off by itself. It doesn't really connect with any of the other samples. So even the computer agrees this sample is doing something different. And I'm not sure why this sample is so strange. Um, we're going to see it pop up again later on in a couple places, but I'm going to mostly ignore it because it's only one sample, so I really can't draw any conclusions from it. Um, next thing that jumped out at me was this big blank area. So if we want to know what's going on, uh, what kinds of samples are responsible for creating this big blank spot on the heat map? Well, let's look at down at the bottom where the samples are listed, and we see that they're mycelium samples. So this M in the sample uh, code means that it's a mycelium sample. So all of the mycelium samples are actually contained in this blue box. The other thing contained in this blue box are all the normal gill samples. There's also another gill sample here. Um, that's a primordial gill sample, normal pileus sample. So gill tissue seems to be particularly, have particularly low expression across the board for some reason. And we're gonna kind of come back to that theme a bit later on. So the mycelium having low expression is good because we wanted to use that as our baseline. So if expression is mostly zero across the mycelium samples, that's good. It makes it really easy to use as a baseline. The fact that gill samples cluster in here is weird, especially all of the normal gill samples seem to have very low expression. Um, other things that are uh, somewhat less similar, but still kind of grouped in this general part of the heat map include another young gill sample, um, a cultivated pileus sample, cultivated gill sample, a primordial gill sample. So again, we're seeing a lot of gills tend to be, tend to have similar expression patterns to the mycelium. Um, okay, another thing you can do to analyze this um, graph is to look at the places where you have a lot of bright colors. So I've actually divided up the uh, dendrogram on the left side of the figure into eight different groups based on um, how similar the expression patterns are to one another. And if you want to know what all eight groups are doing, you can read my thesis. But right now, I'm just going to look at two of these groups, numbers three and seven. So three, I'm going to take away these boxes for a second. If we look at this kind of group three here, we see that it's High, most highly expressed in this kind of middle region. Same with group seven. Uh, group seven expression is generally lower, but it's still most highly expressed in this middle area. So if we get our boxes back um, and we trace down this area where uh, the two groups are most highly expressed, what kinds of samples are responsible? Well, this is where all of these type tissue segregated. Um, so all the type tissue kind of clustered in this middle area and it had relatively consistent expression patterns across the board. Um, it all kind of grouped together, which is interesting. And uh, we're going to come back to the stack tissue a bit later on. So if you wanted to know what's specifically um, going on in the stipe tissue, what genes are more active um, and they, they are responsible for making stipe tissue what it is, you could do some extra analysis and look at all the genes in those two groups to kind of figure out what kinds of things they're doing. And I haven't quite gotten to that part of my analysis yet, but I have the programs that are supposed to do that working. So that's going to be my next step in analysis, kind of um, describe what's going on in these areas that make stipe tissue different than um, gill and pileus and mycelium tissues.
All right, um, another way you can analyze this heat map is to pull out specific genes. And that's what I'm gonna do for the rest of my presentation. Um, there have been a lot of genes that have been um, identified as being linked to flamuline and volutipes um, development. So I kind of was interested to see what those genes were all doing in my research. The first one I wanted to look at was cytochrome P450. And this is an interesting gene because it's been linked repeatedly to development in flamuline and volutipes, but also in the Ingecap mushroom Copernopsis scenario, if you mutate this gene, it actually prevents stipe elongation. So this is kind of interesting from a developmental standpoint. And what's it doing in flamulina? Well, we actually have 19 different cytochrome P450 genes. And um, the ones at the top tend to be expressed at low levels, except for sample 46. So I'm kind of going to ignore this top section of the graph. So let's start at the bottom. This bottom uh, gene, if we look to see where it's most highly expressed, it tends to be expressed in the gills and pileus. Um, all these darker areas represent um, gill and pileus samples. So that's interesting. We have a gene that is particularly highly expressed in specific tissues. If we go up one row, we have another gene that seems to have the opposite pattern. It's expressed throughout the mushroom tissues, but it's most highly expressed in this middle section where all the stipe tissue is arranged. If we go up to the next four genes, we actually see that pattern uh, even more distinctly. Um, these genes are all um, expressed at basically zero levels in the um, rest of the mushroom, and then very highly in the stipe tissues, and particularly in the normal and cultivated forms where, the ha where they have that very long stipe. So again, this is interesting. We have very different gene expression patterns in our different tissues, even though they're all from this same cytochrome P450 gene family. Okay, another gene I wanted to take a look at were the hydrophobins. And hydrophobins um, are kind of a, uh, they coat the outside of fungal cells. So they don't really have a role in any of the events related to um, mushroom development, but they are an end product of tissue differentiation. So we already know that there's a gene hydrophobin, pileus specific hydrophobin, that is um, differentially expressed specifically in the pileus tissue. Uh, there's also another uh, hydrophobin, FVHYD1, that is expressed in the uh, mycelium after mushroom formation begins. So we've got two hydrophobins that show tissue-specific expression. Um, I didn't find either of those um, in my differentially expressed set of genes, but I did find three other ones. And one of them, this light gray one, is highly expressed in all mushroom tissues. Um, another one, this dark gray one, is more interesting because it's expressed only in the stipe tissues. So um, all of these dark gray bars represent stipe tissue. Uh, this one here is in the mycelium, but as you can see, there's two dots here at zero and then one dot that is way up here. Uh, this dot is from uh, sample 46. So if we removed that dot, this dark gray bar would actually disappear. So aside from sample 46, this hydrophobin was expressed only in stipe tissue. So that's a really cool result because now we have three different hydrophobins that mark off specific tissues, one for the pileus, one for the stipe, and one for the mycelium. So if you are a researcher studying flamulina, um, this is something you'll want to pay attention to if you're doing a, a kind of molecular study to figure out when does stipe tissue start to become stipe tissue? Well, now we have this extra hydrophobin that we can use as a marker for stipe tissue um, becoming stipe tissue. Okay, uh, so far the major themes that we've covered here have been that um, tissue level gene expression, um, there's a lot of differences in between tissues in terms of gene expression. So we saw that with the big heat map, um, different tissues had different kind of patterns of colors. Cytochrome P450, again, they were expressed differently in different tissues, 
and our hydrophobins are also being expressed differently in different tissues. So that's one of the main themes to come out of my research. I'm going to transition into a, a different theme now, um, and this is one that I kind of stumbled across when I started looking at these two genes, FDS and FVFD16. So these genes are some of the earliest ones to be linked to mushroom development in Flamulina volutopes, but we have no idea what they are or what they do. So they're really kind of mystery genes in the field of Flamulina volutopes research. Um, so they're kind of markers for development is happening in previous studies, and I wanted to see what they were doing in my work. So when I made this graph, the first thing that I noticed was how strikingly similar their expression patterns are. So they're both high in the same places and low in the same places, which is just kind of astounding because I have no reason to believe that these genes are related to each other at all. Um, they're they were kind of pulled out randomly to begin with, and yet they have these almost mirror image, well, that's not the right term, um, the, they have the exact same expression pattern. It's just kind of amazing. I'm not really sure why that is. But one thing I did notice on this graph is that expression tend to, to be highest in actively growing tissues. And in tissues that we don't expect to be growing very much, their expression levels were much lower. So all these really tall bars represent stipe tissue. Stipe tissue has to grow a lot during all stages of flamulina volutopes development. So um, we expect those cells to be actively growing the entire time. Um, other tissues where expression is low, primordium pileus, we don't really expect that to be doing much. Um, and then the pileus tissue grows, uh, expression in the pileus tissue goes up as the mushroom kind of develops. And then in the normal form, where it's kind of reached its maximum size, it goes down a little bit. Um, we have a similar pattern for gill tissue where the lowest expression is in the normal gills. Again, at this point, they've started releasing their spores. So um, they don't really have to grow any more than they've already done. So that was kind of an interesting result. And it got me thinking that uh, higher expression in these genes linked to development seems to be related to places where the tissue cells are actively growing. And that's actually a pattern that I found in all of the other genes I looked at that have been previously linked to um, development in flamulina volutopes. So I have a few more graphs to illustrate this. Uh, MAP kinases have been shown to be important, and we see that expression is very high basically throughout the, fruit, the uh, actual mushroom tissues, but it decreases, let's see, ooh, normal pileus and normal gills tend to have the lowest expression. Um, the same pattern is repeated with heat shock proteins. Um, I've arranged this graph a little bit differently. So these are all the primordium tissues, uh, pretty high expression. Young mushrooms, pretty high expression. Cultivated mushroom tissues, pretty high expression. It decreases in the normal uh, tissues and specifically in the normal pileus and gills. Uh, we can also see that pattern when we look at WD40 repeat containing proteins. If I pull out all of the normal pileus and normal gill samples, we'll see that expression for these genes is basically zero everywhere except in this one pileus sample. Um, the other things filling in this blank area on the graph are mycelium samples and some gill samples, which we saw earlier had uh, typically low expression levels to begin with. Uh, okay, uh, two more genes that we see this gene families, I should say, that we see this expression pattern with. One of them is uh, lectins. Uh, again, expression is pretty high. It tends to decrease in uh, the primordium for this one um, and in the normal pileus and in the normal gills. Um, so again, tissues that aren't really developing anymore tend to have lower expression levels of the lectins. We see that also with PDD1, where expression is lowest and basically zero in our primordium gills. Um, the normal pileus, and the normal gills. Um, incidentally, I trust this graph less than the other ones that I've shown you, because if we look at the four mycelium sample bars, uh, we see that the range of values for the mycelium is not 
any different than the range of values that we see in the mushroom samples. Um, so I'm not sure that this gene is really linked to development, um, but it has been included as an important developmental gene in previous work, so it was important for me to pull it out here as well. Okay, uh, one gene I want to talk about that was not uh, discussed in any previous research is CDC123. And again, we see the same expression pattern um, where it's very high in stipe tissues, which are actively growing, and it kind of decreases in the normal gills. Um, normal pileus is actually higher in this point. Um, and it seems to be a little bit more variable uh, overall in mushroom tissues. But the difference, especially between stipe tissue and the mycelium, is very striking because only one mycelium sample actually expressed this gene at all, and it was at a very low level. So this gene is also interesting, not for this um, very distinctive expression pattern, but also because it is involved in regulating the cell cycle. So CDC123 actually acts, um, scientists aren't quite sure what it does, but it seems to regulate um, the switch between cell growth and cell division. So its uh, function is right at the point in the cell cycle where the cell decides, is it going to get bigger and just keep getting bigger or is it going to start dividing? And that's a very interesting result because um, all these previous graphs that were showing us, uh, tissues tend to be, uh, gene expression tends to be higher in actively growing tissues. Well, now we have a gene that directly links that pattern to a potential point of regulation in the overall cell cycle. So that's really exciting. And I really hope um, future researchers look into this gene and figure out uh, what other genes are interacting with this gene, regulating its expression, and how um, the cell cycle overall is interacting with um, mushroom cell growth during development. Uh, so that's kind of what was most exciting to me, um, this one gene, CDC123. Okay, uh, so I went over a lot of different stuff. What should you remember from my presentation? Uh, first of all, tissue has a larger impact on gene expression than developmental stage. So anybody looking to study mushroom development in the future has to consider tissue in their um, experimental design because tissues are where all the interesting stuff is going on. So we can't just plop a whole mushroom in at various stages and analyze what genes are doing. We have to look at those tissue level differences. Secondly, uh, we now have three tissue specific hydrophobins for flamuline of lutepes, and that's going to really uh, help understand what's happening at a molecular level in future work because we have markers for three different tissues now. Um, third, Mushroom growth seems to be controlled mostly by regulating cell growth. Uh, we saw this throughout the presentation where um, that fits with our idea of the general model of mushroom development where tissues just have to get bigger in order to make the mushroom bigger. Um, we also saw it in the graphs that where um, gene expression was highest in actively growing tissues and also that linked up with um, CDC123, which suggests a mechanism in linking cell, uh, sorry, linking mushroom growth to the actual cell cycle. Uh, furthermore, because CDC123 acts right at that um, switch from cell growth to cell division, it could provide more insights about what makes determinate growth different from indeterminate growth because I suspect that these two types of growth are um, mostly different by how they uh, regulate their cell cycle. So this one gene um, can help us understand um, the role of cell growth in our basic model and then can help us extend that model into indeterminate growth mushrooms. So this is really cool. Um, I really hope some other researchers pick these themes up and continue on with them in future developmental uh, mushroom development work. Okay, uh, I have a lot of references that I am showing to you because you can pause the presentation at any point and look at these if you're interested. Um, one more slide. 
Okay, uh, but more helpful than that probably is uh, these couple of resources. First of all, I have collected all of my background research on flamulina volutipes and put it on my website, Fungus Fact Friday, which you can access uh, either by following the link on the screen or by scanning the QR code. And that'll take you to the section of my website where the background material is um, collected. Uh, another great resource if you're interested in mushroom development is this book, Fungal Morphogenesis by David Moore. Even though it was published in 1998, it is still the most complete resource we have on mushroom development. So this field is moving along slowly, but I'm hoping we're finally getting to that point where we can start to pull back the black box of mushroom development. Okay, I have a lot of different people I would like to thank for help uh, getting my research going. So I got funding from the University of wisconsin La Crosse, the Sonoma County Mycological Association, the Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club, and the Mycological Association of Washington. I also have to thank my advisory committee, Todd Osmondson, Tom Volk, Ann Galbraith, and Jennifer Miskowski, and also all the people who helped me get liquid nitrogen. Topping that list is Sterling Hayashi Tanner, and then there were also so many people who, um, when Sterling wasn't available, helped me find liquid nitrogen and really saved my project at a couple points. Um, I also want to thank Dylan Baldessari for lending me his pressure cooker. I did all of my sterilization using the pressure cooker because it was much more reliable than the autoclave. And lastly, I have to thank Beth Palak for uh, lending me all those petri dishes throughout my research. Okay, um, that is all I have for you today. Um, normally, I would ask uh, if you have any questions. Um, since this is a recording, I can't get any feedback from you. But uh, feel free to reach out um, to me either through my website or through um, uh, my work at now Clark University um, to if you have any questions about my research or want to know how to get involved with mushroom development work or anything of that nature. Uh, thank you for watching my thesis defense presentation.